Okay, so how'd the homework assignment go? Everybody has Android Studio running on their computer with a working uh, Android emulator doing stuff. All right, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the, uh, well, we're going to talk about the grading in the class in general real quick. It's my normal spiel for my all my classes except for the research class. Um, and then uh, um, I'm going to introduce a topic to you, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do um, throughout the semester, starting with what we're going to do over the next several weeks. All right, so if you've had my classes before, this is the normal spiel. Homework 60% of your grade, midterm 20%, final 20%. Um, so there'll be uh, some sort of midterm thing, whether it'll be a written exam or a presentation or a paper, something like that. Uh, same thing with the final, whatever makes sense when we get to that. Uh, we'll have to see how things evolve during the first eight weeks to see what makes sense for a midterm. Everything else that isn't midterm or final is a homework assignment. So there's always a risk of like a pop quiz in class covering something that we either had for homework or talked about the previous class, blah, blah, blah. Those count as homework assignments as well. All right. Um, there will be some extra credit opportunities, I'm sure, during the semester. I always come up with some way of trying to bribe you to go to some event or something because we need people and you get free homework assignment out of that. So keep your eyes open for that stuff. What's up? Be a hackathon that you're going to want us to go to. I just want to prepare. Yes. Okay. Do you know when that's going to be? No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> but, but I can try to find out some information. I don't think anybody knows when it's going to be at this point. So, um, but there will be a Saturday morning hackathon at some point during the semester. Um, okay. So let's talk about computer programming some. I know some of you have had some computer programming before. Many of you haven't or haven't had very much computer programming before, uh, which is kind of interesting, right? Because um, uh, you would think in a master's program it would be the other way around, but most com fairly commonly it's not because you have a lot of people who have bachelor's in other disciplines who come and do a master's degree uh, in computer science and don't necessarily have the computer science background that somebody who had an undergrad in computer science might have. All right, so I'm going to um, assume a relative small amount of computer programming background, um, yet I will also assume, given that you are grad students, that you have the um, learning capability and perseverance to work hard and play catch up in between. All right, so uh, I expect you to suck, but work hard. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so something in that in that ballpark. Okay, um, so let's uh, just kind of go through some of these uh, introductory slide things, and then I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about a concept that we're going to be focusing on, kind of a topic that we're going to be building tools around the, during the semester, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so. Uh, what is computer programming to, to us? How many of you have had, uh, um, uh, well, let's go around. What languages, what, what skills have we had in computer science or computer programming? What languages have we worked with? Start throwing stuff out. C++. C++. Java. Java. Python. Python. C -sharp. Who? C -sharp. PL SQL. Okay, PL SQL. C Sharp. C -sharp. Okay. Anything else? All right, Python. All right, so um, as you saw, we're going to be doing some Java stuff in here through Android, but we'll also be doing probably some Python stuff because we're going to be writing some server side things. So we're um, one of the things we're kind of looking at here is uh, if you were out there in industry and you were having to write a um, create a project for an employer or something like that, a lot of times projects are going to have multiple sides. You're going to have front ends and maybe mobile applications and maybe websites and maybe servers that have to service something on the back end. So we're going to, and also a database. So we're going to be talking about how do we connect all these different things and we're going to do it in the context of early on smaller problems. Okay, that will still seem hard, but they're smaller problems. And later on, we'll just keep multiplying the problems by a thousand, um, but give you the same amount of time to work on them. It's still, yeah, so does that sound, sound <laughs> fair? All right, so computer programming is a skill that a computer scientist possesses that sets them apart from other professional problem solvers. So you go back to Dr. Locklear's uh, 
uh, idea of what is computer science. And we could say computer science is problem solving. Well, human beings in general are professional problem solvers, right? Okay, uh, you know, in the very first programming class, I usually ask students, you know, how many of you got to class today without, you know, bump in, bumping into any walls or something like that? And you get a couple of smart asses that say, yeah, I bumped into walls. But realistically, you're walking down the hall and you're texting on your phone or something like that. And you're bobbing and weaving in and out of people without even paying any attention, right? As human beings, we are really, 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 really good problem solvers. We're professional problem solvers. And no matter what your career is, you're solving problems in the, in the context of normal human life as well as, you know, your vocation. So what sets us apart as computer science people? Programming. Okay, programming is our kung fu, so to speak. Okay, um, so we can use that to force computers to do our will. All right, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in here. So how can we weaponize it? Um, in today's entrepreneurial world to bring value to others. So I know several of you in here already have done some entrepreneurial stuff. Are you still working on your project? How's that going? It's going well. Okay. Have you, do you guys have clients and stuff yet? Or what's yeah, the... We've got actually, not a, we have a few lined up for like a camera that we want to send to people. Yep. Also like people will, will like, have asked us to do some film. Uh, yep. Okay. And we're going to look at some opportunities throughout the semester for us to create some projects that could be uh, entered into entrepreneurial competitions, kind of like CU Launch, things like that, uh, as well as something that could turn into an actual startup company. All right, so we're going to look at a lot of different uh, things. But uh, if you look at startup companies today, a very high percentage of them revolve around software of some time, of, of some type, right? That doesn't mean the business is software. A lot of times software is some tool that helps the business kind of run. All right, so we want to know how can we weaponize this kung fu skill set we have, this computer programming skill set, to do cool things that other people can't. All right, that's kind of our, uh, our punchline. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of things here. Um, now, I'm going to interject a few slides in that are kind of from my beginning programming uh, courses um, slide set uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. This might be review for some of you. Um, uh, those of you who had to take like 200 as a online thing, you've seen it, but you'll see it again. But this at least guarantees everybody's on the same page. All right. So something I like to think about is how do humans solve problems? All right. I'm going to kind of go through these relatively quickly rather than ask for a lot of uh, feedback, but you can always answer if you know the answer out loud. But so I like to think about, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, human beings are professional problem solvers, right? So if we're professional problem solvers and computer programming is our tool for solving problems with a computer, how do we actually solve problems? Well, we use our memory, we ask questions, and we do repetition, all right? And uh, I'll share these slides and put them up on Blackboard so you'll have access to all of these. All right, this is how human beings solve problems. All right, now, we have this tool, programming language, that acts as the intermediary between us and the computer, right? So when we walked into this class, I started speaking English to all of you, right? Okay, did, when you walked in, did you assume I was probably going to use English? You know, you, you, there was no question whether I was going to teach the class in German or Russian or anything like that. We kind of figured, okay, middle of Wisconsin. Concordia tends to have most of their classes taught in English. Probably we're going to be choosing the English protocol for this class, right? Okay. You guys are humans. I'm a human. We, we all speak English. So we chose English as our medium, right? Now, we have lots of different programming languages. Um, and we're going to choose Java in here, but uh, there really isn't a rhyme or reason other than the fact that Android runs on all your machines. It doesn't matter what kind of computer you have. Uh, so that's why I chose that. But um, the job of a programming language is to allow a human to tell a computer what to do in a way that is similar to how we already solve problems. Okay? Now, in real life, when we think about hum the human level of fairness, uh, when you gr agree upon a language, it's you know you might be willing to, to meet halfway. So, um, for instance, your native language is what? 
back home. Okay, and if you're talking to somebody from um, Hyderabad, you might they they would be well, but but their language would be Telugu, right? Okay, so you guys aren't compatible there. So you would you would drop down to the state language of India, which is Hindi, right? And just agree upon that. See, that's fair, right? So you're not asking them to learn your language. They're not asking you to learn their language. Um, but you you both kind of just hobble your way through Hindi, right? Okay. That's human fairness, right? Now in computer programming, we don't operate that way because humans are greedy, right? So it goes, what's the language that a computer speaks? Binary. Binary, zeros and ones. And do we want to tap stuff out with that two button keyboard? Yeah, not, not for human consumption, right? Similarly, if we look at a low level language like assembly, where we have to tell a computer each little tiny little step it needs to do, do we want to do that either? Well, we could. Maybe it's fun for a class like 548 next semester. Really? Is that a grad class? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We read a lot of uh, the whole class is assembler. Um, yeah. You won't be saying that. All right. So, um, uh, if you let me just quickly, I don't want to leave too much stuff out. So, let me jump here and say, um, I'm not going to cover all these different things, but I'm going to say three kinds of programming languages. We're going to say machine language, low level language, high level language. Okay, you already told me machine language is zeros and ones. Okay, we don't like that. Human beings, we don't want to have the two button keyboard. Now, a low-level language has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU, whereas a high-level language has a one-to-many relationship with the CPU. Okay? Now, in order to understand this, and we're going to go into this a lot more detail next semester in 548, but we want to think about what's the nature of the CPU. Okay, so when I ask what is the CPU, what, what what's your what's your default answer? Everybody always says what it stands for first, right? Yeah. Okay, central processing unit. Okay, but what is it? It does magic. It does magic. It does do magic. CPU does do magic. All right. So I like to think of the CPU as a collection of magic tricks <laughs> that, when called in a specific order solve an actual problem. All right, so let me give you some uh, um, uh, kind of an example of this. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something most of you aren't going to be able to do, okay? I know it's going to be impressive, but try not to clap. All right, so I'm, I'm going to put my hand up here. I'm going to go like that. Can any of you do that? Some of you can do that? Can you do this? Are any of you impressed by that? What good is this move? Can I use this for anything? Grab it just looks weird. Ah, to grab something. So if I'm going to pick up this cup here, I have a series of little movements that I do to ultimately grasp this cup, right? Okay. Each one of these little things is a little magic trick, a little, you know, a magic trick that the human body can do, right? And nobody's overly impressed if I'm just sitting here doing this. You know, you just kind of raise your hand in chapel and people just kind of look at you like you're, you're the special one, <laughs> right? Okay. So, okay, nobody's impressed if uh, you do these little tiny moves. But all of a sudden, if you could do these moves together in, in, a, in a way, you can solve real problems. Picking up a, a coffee cup, you know, drinking a soda, driving a car. Now, there are some people who are like professional athletes, for example, who could put together some of those moves in really advanced ways that a normal person might not be able to. Those are really, really, really well-programmed programs, right? They're putting together a series of magic tricks that solve problems really efficiently that maybe the average person couldn't quite pull off. Does that make sense? So just as we are a collection of magic tricks, we have a whole bunch of little abilities, things that we can do, and, then, and when we put those in a certain order, we can solve real problems. The CPU is the same thing. So the folks over at Intel, 
they, uh, for example, you know, one of the processor makers, you know, they came up with this giant list of magic tricks, this giant list of instructions that they decided these are all the little magic tricks that might need to be performed in order to solve all programs that could be solved on a computer. All right, and when next year's processor comes out, what do they do? They update some of the existing magic tricks. Maybe they, they add a couple of new magic tricks, but they make sure all the old magic tricks still exist. That way the software that you bought last year still runs this year. Make sense? Or the software you buy this year still runs in your last year's stuff. Otherwise you're, you become Apple because you know, then your stuff stops. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so kind of get the high level version of what a CPU is. All right, I'm not gonna dive into it too much more than that, but we're gonna say that that's good. Okay, did you see all those magic tricks I just put together there? It was, evil. It was awesome. I know you're all jealous because you can't do some of those things, but it's, you know. Okay, so that's what a CPU is, collection of magic tricks. Now back to this slide where I said there's three kinds of programming languages, our low level and our high level language. The low level languages have a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. So if we want to think about this in real life, if I want to pick up this coffee cup and I asked you to tell me all the little steps I needed to take to to uh, pick up that coffee cup, that would be pretty tedious, right? You're telling me to fire certain muscles and you know bend the thumb and and you know you know get ready to engage the weight and you know <laughs> just all sorts of stuff, right? So even though it seems like something we don't even really think about, if you were having to give me all the little tiny instructions of what it would take to pick up that cup, it would be pretty tedious pretty quick, right? Okay. And then take that to the next level and think about telling somebody maybe how to walk how complex that set of those sets of movements are, right? Okay, so now are you convinced that human beings are really, really, really good problem solvers? Especially since you're texting while walking? Okay, so we're solving a much, much easier problem when it comes to writing software. So really, computer programming is trivial compared to what we do every single day. Makes sense, right? It won't seem that way. <laughs> when we actually do it, okay, because we've been practicing the whole human problem solving thing for a couple of minutes, whereas the programming thing, you know, not so, not so long, okay? So I want to take a minute, I want to go look at a low-level language example. So we're going to look at uh, Hello World Linux Assembly. Now, just to give you the, a quick example here, in a high level language, this is, this is our power tool, okay? So high level languages, every one line we write in a high level language translates into a bunch of magic tricks. So it's like, pick up cup of coffee. And I just did a whole bunch of things in a row and you, I just took one command, right? Similarly, if we were writing the Python version of Hello World, Right there. <laughs> Beautiful. Right? One line of code. Now, let's look at Hello World in assembly language, which is a low-level language. Now, I'm going to give you a warning here. The, the assembly language we're looking at here in a second is actually, actually contains power tools. It's not even as bad as it could be. We're having the operating system help us. Yeah. Okay, so let's go over to this guy. Didn't I type in stuff? I type, typed in stuff, right? Or am I not on the internet? Oh, I'm on guest. How come I keep defaulting to guest here on campus? I have Falconet on the higher thing. The, the guest just seems to be like the... Why now? Yeah. <laughs> just the other day, my account got blocked out. Ah, what are you going to do? They like to keep us on our, toe, on our toes. It was probably something stupid, like one of the cruises I was on and changed the order of uh, my network stack or something like that. Or, or maybe even I was having problems getting on Wi-Fi or something on a cruise, reset my network stack, and it just so happened the first time I came back on campus, it joined guest first, and now that guy is like my preferred network. At some point, I'll spare 30 seconds and fix it. <laughs> All right, so hello world in assembly. All right, can we read that? Big enough? 
All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get up and walk a little bit because um, just cause, just because I hate this chair, because my butt does not fit in that chair. It's <laughs> the problem. What you're laughing at me? Is this like a fat shaming? No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> or is it the my stylish backpack? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you were in the other uh, grad class? Well, you didn't have haven't met yet. This yet have you? Which is the 548? Yeah. Yeah, I have that. No, 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 no. The uh, Dr. Lockhart's class, oh. the Thursday class. They didn't meet last week, right? It'll be far less entertaining than this. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually told Dr. Lockhart that today. <laughs> what do you she think called him that? Grandpa. <laughs> we were at Bible study, and she wanted to get a physical Bible, you know, so, so Ms. Dr. Lockhart wouldn't, like, make fun of her. You know, because like, well, he's like, he's like a grandpa. He's gonna be, you know, what does he, does he bring his Bible in on scrolls? <laughs> I <not> say that. <laughs> so she's there with a physical Bible, and he, he used, he does his Bible on a second generation iPad. <laughs> Top shelf stuff. All right. <laughs> so now I'm telling you this is using power tools here. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna forget about these top two things up here, just forget about that. Our program starts here, where it says start, okay? Now, these first four things, now remember, this is a low-level language, so each line of code here translates to exactly one magic trick on the CPU, okay? So, now these dudes right here, EDX, ECX, EBX, EAX, these are what are called hardware registers. Okay, so if you had 548, you've, uh, you've heard about these things before. But we could just think about them as little tiny memory locations where we could put a value. Okay? Now, so these four lines here, we're going to do some stuff. Down here, we're using some memory. Okay, so I said the three ways human beings solve problems is we use our memory, we ask questions, and repetition. Right? So we're going to remember a couple of things here. We're going to create a variable called MSG. This is our message, and our message is going to be hello world. We're going to create another variable here called len for length. This is going to be the length of hello world. Okay, it's remembering two pieces of information. What do I want to print to the screen and how long it is? All right? So now we're going to move the length into this memory location. We're going to move the message into this memory location. We're going to move the number one, just randomly the number one, into this memory location. Then we're going to move the number four, again, randomly the number four, into this memory location. Then we're going to interrupt the CPU. And when we interrupt the CPU, so we've given four instructions to our CPU here. We're going to interrupt the CPU and we're going to call the kernel, call the operating system itself. In this case, it's Linux. Okay, there's our power tool. So, like, look, yeah, I'm a low level programmer here, but I don't want to write too much code. So, all I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of tell Linux what I actually want to have done. And I'm going to ask Linux to go do it for me. Okay? So, the very first thing when we call this, Linux goes and checks whatever's in EAX. And it says, ah, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to do number four. Okay? Well, what is number four? Number four is related to the syswrite system call. So, somebody, a bunch of smart people, on Linux years ago, actually it was probably copied from Unix before that, wrote this gigantic program called SysWrite that knows how to talk to the graphics card and show stuff up on the monitor and all this stuff to ultimately print something to the screen. All right, let's just call that a thousand lines of code inside of there that we don't have to write, okay, because we're relying on that operating system to do that heavy lifting for us. All right, so Linux says, ah, you want me to do, you want me to do uh, uh, my, my special uh, function number four, which is syswrite. Okay, so in order for syswrite to work, we need three inputs. I need to know where you want me to write it, I need to know what you want me to write, and I need to know how long it is. Those are the three pieces of information I need in order to accomplish this. Okay? So, Linux says, this is what you want me to do. I'm gonna look in this location to find out where you want me to write it. Number one relates to standard output, which is the monitor. Standard input is the keyboard, okay? Then it's gonna look here to find out what am I writing? And that's our message, hello world. 
And then it's going to look here to find out how long it is. And you have to know how long it is because all this stuff is just getting loaded into memory. So after this exclamation point here, there's more stuff in memory that another program might be using. And if we don't tell syswrite to stop, it's just going to keep printing out stuff that's random symbols and stuff like that from memory. So we're saying, go for the length of hello world and then stop. Go ahead. So when it uh, calls a kernel, um, initializes, um, does, it does it start redoing it from the bottom up so it goes like A, B, C, D um, on there? Because like, I know- You mean these four lines? Yes. You could, these could be in any order. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. It's All, Linux, Linux relies on what you want to do to be in here and then the parameters to be in these other three. Okay. Linux expects the parameter of where you want to write to be in EBX. But you could have moved that in there first. Okay, because that's what I was saying. Like, does Linux do EAX first and then EBX, or is it how you write them in? It, it, it's, the function is defined to look in certain places in uh, memory, oh, certain okay. names of registers. Okay. So you have to know how those system calls are written. Okay, gotcha. If you're going to call them directly at this. Usually we're writing high-level code where we write it, then we compile it, and it writes this for us, right. does this part for us. But if you're writing it by hand, this is what it looks like. Now, it didn't matter what order these four lines were in. Just as soon as we tell Linux to take over, it's going to look here to find out what you want to do, and then get its parameters from the other three places. Gotcha. All right? So at that point, some stuff spits out to the screen. Hello, world. Out on the screen. Then we come back to the CPU. Now we overwrite EAX. Remember, EAX is the place I told you that Linux first checks. It used to have a 4 in it. Now I'm going to put a 1 in it. And then I'm going to interrupt the CPU again. Now, these three buckets, these three registers, still have stuff in them. But it doesn't matter, because Linux isn't going to use those things again. Because when I interrupt the CPU and tell the kernel to take over, Linux is going to immediately go to EAX and say, what magic trick would you like me to do now? And we say number 1 which is sysexit. And it doesn't need any inputs for sysexit to work. Sysexit just kills the program. Make sense? So this guy here and this guy here, syswrite, sysexit, are big, 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 big programs that are doing some really complex things that we didn't have to write. So even though this seems kind of cryptic, we're still using power tools. Okay, but this is still scarier. This is still scarier than that guy, right? Print hello world, this, we like this better as people. All right, I mean, this is cool. Like, you know, if somebody was coming by and you wanted them to feel like you were like a real computer scientist, you pop open the, you know, your text editor in the background, it's like, yeah, I was just hammered out some assembly. You know, and as soon as they walk away, you go back to your, you know, visual basic. <laughs> just double click on that button there and it works. Um, <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Okay. So, make sense? So, three kinds of programming languages. Machine level, not our cup of tea. Um, although, in 548, we'll look at how do you convert a low-level language into machine code. All right, um, but at the same time, as human beings who are going to be developers writing software that does some stuff, we're writing high-level code. So that's what we'll be focusing on in here. All right, so high-level language, any language you've probably heard of is a high-level language. All right, so that is Java, C Sharp, C++, Objective-C, Swift, Python, blah, blah, blah. All right, so now I'm going to steal this slide here real quick. I usually call this guy the mapping. One hundred percent of programming languages have facilities for these three things. Usually memory is done through variables. Asking questions is done through conditionals. And repetition is done through loops and functions or procedures or methods or however you want to think about them. Okay, so 100% of programming languages have facilities for these three things. Now with that in mind, my argument would be that the programming language does not matter. 
If you have a bunch of experience in Python and now all of a sudden you have to do a project in C++, it's not a big deal. You say, how do I create variables in C++? How do I ask questions in C++? So how do I write if statements? How do I write loops and functions? Okay, and once you've gotten those syntaxes under your belt, you can all of a sudden solve a huge classification of problems in that language, even though you just learned that language 15 minutes ago. And then over the first several weeks, you kind of learned a little idiosyncrasies of that language. Make some sense? All right, so the programming language does not matter. But 100% of computer programming languages will have facilities for these things. Okay. So we talked about the CPU. Uh, let's talk about model view controller. Uh, before we talk about that, let me just throw out there this idea of something called a design pattern. So a design pattern is a proposed good solution to a common problem. All right, where common problems could be almost anything depending on what field you're in. Uh, and what is a good solution? So a good, you know, an example might be if you're, you make peanut butter and jellies, you know, you might think that you know how to make a good peanut butter and jelly, but maybe you know you have a different technique. You know, do you put the peanut butter on first? Do you put the jelly on first? You just throw everything up in the air and just start catching it with the bread? This, Mr. Gonzalez kind of does it that way. It's weird. Um, so, <laughs> inside joke. Okay, so... <laughs> That's what a um, design pattern is in general. Now, we have um, academics a lot of times use design patterns to get like free publications. You know, if you come up with a crazy name for something and then you say, hey, I think this would be a pretty good solution to this kind of this problem. And then you publish a paper on it and worse that happens, somebody comes back and says, yeah, that's an okay solution, but here's a better one. And you say, ah, yes, you're right. And you still have the publication and now you've advanced the field. You know, so it's an academic thing. Publish or perish. All right, so that's what a design pattern is in general. Now, one of the famous design patterns is this thing called MVC. And you've actually already had experience with it working with Android Studio in this last week's homework assignment. So MVC stands for Model View Controller. And what this guy specifically says is it's a good idea to separate your code from your interface, from your data database. Okay, keep those things in different places. All right, um, so if you think back to your Android tutorial from this last uh, um, uh, week, you had an interface you designed, right? And that was all in one place. You were dragging stuff on there and you had a button that you clicked, it took you to a second screen, that kind of, that kind of stuff. That was all the interface, that was the view. Okay, then you had the Java files, your main activity.java. That was the controller. Okay, that's where your logic lives. Now, you didn't actually deal with models in that. That's if you have data that you need to store somewhere. So just assume that if you were dealing with a model, that would be in another place, a third place. Okay, so MVC is just an idea. It's an idea that says, you know, as programs get more and more complicated, you're going to wish that you kept these parts of the application separate. Otherwise, things are going to get real messy real quick. Make some sense? Okay, so that's what MVC is. All right, so now, how many of you have heard of, if you've ever gone and looked at, like, computer programming jobs and things like that, you may have seen something that says full stack. Have you seen full stack before? You know, you're looking at a, um, a job and it might say, we're looking for a full stack developer. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a full stack developer? You're a stinking liar. <laughs> you're a stinking liar. All right, well, so, so tell me more. So a full stack developer is supposed to be able to decode all aspects of a modern application. So you have the back end, which is like a database or some sort of data source. You'll have a middleware layer and then you're going to have usually a front end layer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I think typically, um, from if you're looking for a programming job that mentions full stack, you should be able to create interfaces, but I don't think their expectations are at like graphical designer level. 
uh, for that. They're probably going to have an artist or something like that, but you should be able to put together an interface, functional interface that you know doesn't make people throw up. Um, you should be able to have a front-end logic portion of your application, right? And you should be able to make that guy talk to maybe a back-end server side of your application. And then you should also be able to have both of those pieces be able to talk to maybe a database somewhere. Okay, so you're, you're handling kind of the entire workflow of a modern application where you have a server, you have a database, you have a front end, well, you have a, you know, kind of the, the logic on, you know, if we're thinking about a mobile app, the logic on the mobile app, and then the interface that connects to that logic. Make sense? All right, so we're all going to be full stack developers when we're done with this class because we're going to deal with each one of those individual pieces. Now, typically, when a company says we're looking for a full stack person, you know, they're saying we want you to be an expert in all of those different pieces. And that person does exist who maybe, um, you know, likes working on user experience, likes working on the, uh, the front end logic of an application. They like working on the uh, back end server side of an application, or they like writing the interface piece with the database. Um, maybe that you find that person who just, they just like all of that. Typically though, what a developer does is they become versed in all those things where like if they had to do it, you know, if they were the, the, the one person show and they had to do all those individual pieces, they could. But you end up kind of taking a liking to one of them. Like I really like writing this kind of stuff because I hate user interfaces. Or, you know, databases are okay. I can write and connect to a database, but you know what? I don't want to do all this like, heavy join queries and crazy things to pull together 50 different tables to get information. That's somebody else's job. I'll just write quick, dirty select statements, maybe joining things between two tables, and we'll just call that good enough. In fact, maybe even half the time, the programmer who doesn't really like doing SQL queries on a database, they might just pull in all the information from the table and just do the sorting and merging and stuff like that code, through code. Okay, Lazy, but if that's your bread and butter, that's what you do, right? Okay, so each person will probably have their favorite thing. Even somebody who is hired as a full stack developer probably has the one or two things they really like doing, the other stuff they just can do. Okay, so full stack says you can write all aspects of a modern application. Not necessarily that you want to, but that you could. Okay. So, skills of a full stack developer, let's say, is you need to be able to program. And programming is kind of a tool that's going to be applied to several different layers, uh, layers there, and it might be different languages. So a lot of times the server side stuff you write might be written in one language, whereas the client side stuff, maybe your Android application might be, in this case, is written in Java. Um, uh, and then the actual front end user interface is written in XML. Um, we'll look at some of those things as we kind of get to it. Um, and then you're, you're going to have your connection to your database. Well, we're going to have our Android application talking to the database. And then you also have your backend server that also maybe needs to talk to the database. And maybe that's a Python server. All right, so all sorts of different uh, computer programming skills for different languages you might use to do these things. Okay, so you're going to have the backend and the front end server side stuff. So if we draw a picture of this, kind of what a modern application looks like. We're gonna just throw up here, maybe we have a database. And then we have a, we'll just call this server side. And we'll call this guy client side. All right, and that client side is probably going to be like your Android application in our, in our little world here, so. All right, and that Android application kind of has two pieces to it. That has a user experience and front end logic. All right, so you dealt with this in your last assignment, right? You had a little user interface and you had some logic behind that user interface. Make sense? All right, but you didn't have any connection back here and you weren't talking to a database. 
So this client side guy here might connect into a server. He might also talk to a database directly. And the server side might also know how to talk to the database. So all your data, these are your models, are stored up here. The server side might need some of that information. The client side might need some of that information. The server side and the client side maybe talk to each other. So this is kind of your modern application, right? Now, you also could have a situation, pretty commonly anymore, where you have multiple clients. So for instance, let's say you have the E-Trade application on your smartphone. That's the bank you use. Let's say that's an example. Well, I might be a client of E-Trade. You might be a client of E-Trade. So I have my Android phone. You have your Android phone. We're both talking to E-Trade server. We're both talking to E-Trade's database, but we are different front ends for that same application. So now you have different clients for the same single back end server. And then you might even have clustered servers where instead of you programming for one server, this might be 30 or 40 servers. Okay, so for all of us who are talking to like Google, when we do a Google search, how many Google searches do you think get done per minute? A lot, rounding down, okay? Do you think that's just one computer sitting in the basement at Google headquarters? Or do they have this giant farm of computers that when your, your request comes in, it just goes to whichever one's less busy? It's probably what happens, all right? So this whole server side thing here might be 500 computers duplicated that are all networked together and load balanced and all this stuff, all right? So depending on how we're solving our problem, we might take some of these pieces here and multiply them. How many of you heard of things called like cloud computing? Okay, cloud computing is like a fancy way of saying a elastic server. So we have, a, you know, instead of having one server that sits there, we have a cloud computing platform says, look, we'll give you a server and if you need extra horsepower, we'll just duplicate that server for you and just magically handle the load balancing for you. So you don't have to worry about it from your application. You don't have to have your application route stuff to whichever server is less busy. We'll just do it for you. No problem, you just pay us. That's a service, right? All right, so we call this full stack as being able to do all these different pieces. Now in this class, we are going to dabble in each of these areas, okay? You've already dipped your toe into the client side, right? We're gonna do a lot more toe dipping <laughs> on the client side there. Um, but we'll also work with databases, we'll also work with some server side stuff. Okay, questions about any of that stuff so far? So far so good? Okay, so what is our goal? So our goal in here is to leverage the skills we currently possess um, now, as I mentioned before, some of you have had quite a bit of programming experience. Others have had very little programming experience. That's okay. So I want the stronger programmers to help the weaker programmers. I want the weaker programmers to learn from the stronger programmers. This is going to mean that there's going to be quite a bit of collaboration probably on homework assignments. My job at the end of the semester is to give you a grade based on how well you've mastered the material. Okay, not did you sit in some corner crying yourself to sleep at night, not able to do your homework. All right, I don't care how you learn this stuff as long as you learn it. All right, so I'm going to encourage you to work together on homework assignments and stuff like that, but don't work together on them just to get it done. Because I'll find out on the midterm and the final. Okay, it'll be pretty obvious. Like who's the one running the show and who's just sitting there trying to get their homework done. Okay, and because you need to get a decent grade in the class, um, you get 100% on 60% of your grade and 0% on the other 40%, it's not good, right? Okay, it doesn't matter how much extra credit you do. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna gain competence and skills that you lack and from, from more experienced classmates. Uh, you also wanna appreciate the values of the skills you have as a computer scientist. So some of you will already have some problem solving skills that you're gonna bring to the table even if you don't have a skill in computer programming, you actually might, you know, we started off this discussion today talking about how good human beings are at problem solving. 
every one of you in here is a professional problem solver. When we start thinking about writing software to solve a problem, that's when our own brain gets in the way because then we start thinking about our limitations. So you might actually notice that some of the folks in here who have less programming experience might have some pretty good ideas for the project we're working on because they're not going to be limited by maybe the fear they might have of what they've done before versus have never done before. You know, what the limitations of programming might be. Okay, and ultimately make yourself more employable by being part of something that uh, would count as work experience on your resume. So like I said, we're gonna kind of generate like a startup company type of uh, thing here. And this is ultimately going to, um, if some of you want to continue on with it after the class, that's fine. Otherwise, you just throw it on your resume that, hey, I was part of this project. We did this, this, and this, and this, and that's full stack experience and move on with life. If nothing else, it's a lie that can help you maybe get an interview and then you take it over from there. Make sense? Fake it until you make it. All right. So our problem. Um, in general, why do we write software instead of doing work ourselves? Efficiency. Well, are you, you're not efficient? Not as efficient as the computer is. Well, so what's, what, 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 uh, what does the computer have over us? Okay, so a computer can do certain things very quickly. What kinds of things? Things, you tell it to do. things that we tell it to do. So it can only do the stuff that we can articulate it, articulate to it to do. All right. Now, what are some of the benefits computers have over us? Whatever we tell it to do, it does well. It can compute things faster than we can. Okay. With problems of significant size. Well, even problems of small size. I mean, it could probably add a million numbers, little tiny numbers together, much quicker than you could. It's like, I don't know, I'm pretty fast at adding. <laughs> Do computers get tired? Do computers get bored? Do computers get distracted? So all of these things that human beings fall prey to, computers don't have to deal with. Even if it was a problem we could solve in real life, we'd eventually get bored, wear out, start making mistakes, that kind of stuff. Go ahead. Although your recording program didn't work right at the beginning of class. Well, that's true, but I had to restart it. So whoever wrote that wrote a buggy thing. Actually, it used, it used to work 100% of the time until Apple's uh, latest yeah. software update. Now it's kind of a 50-50 shot of whether it starts up or if I have to kill it and then start it again. Okay. So sometimes it takes some human oversight too, right? When I looked at it, because you know, if you just get a row of zeros up there and it's not counting, that means it's not recording. It's a fake. Okay. But in this one, it's still going. It's still, still cooking. All right. So go ahead. Um, well, I, I guess I don't necessarily, I mean, I'd be, I'd be speculating. Um, let's say maybe. I mean, the idea would be that um, how did we learn to become bored? By doing the same thing over and over again. Possibly. So the question is, did we learn to be bored because it was a learn trait or are human beings pre-wired to get bored and we just ultimately stumbled upon that? We finally hit a threshold where we were bored. Because one of the things with machine learning is we can solve problems that we can't necessarily articulate to a computer how to solve. So there might be something that a human being can do that we couldn't tell a computer in a series of steps, series of magic tricks, how to solve it. Yet we know as people we can do it and we can sort of kind of at a high level maybe explain to somebody how to do it, but we can't really write a program to tell a computer how to do it. Not that it's impossible, just we can't articulate it at a, at a um, you know, I guess an unambiguous enough level for the computer to understand. Yet we can, we can use machine learning or potentially could use machine learning to train that computer on the pattern of that problem. And then all of a sudden it can solve that problem. So that's why uh, neural networks are sometimes referred to as black boxes. You have this thing that solves a problem, yet the person who trained the neural network doesn't know how it's solving the problem internally. They just learn that balance. 
So then to your question, if we are training a neural network or a collection of neural networks to solve some problem, could, is it possible that it could learn the pattern of boredom? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, if, if, it's, if it's a learnable trait, I'd say yes. If it's just a part of our nature that we get tired, we get distracted, we, you know, those kind of things, then I think a computer maybe wouldn't um, fall prey to that. But then you flip it around and say, well, what if we trained a computer to act like a human? You know, where it did, you know, you had multiple inputs, it was trying to process those inputs all at the same time. You artificially slowed down its processor so it could get overwhelmed. You know, if you had 20 conversations going on at once in here, we would all get distracted, right? Yet a computer, as long as it could piece out the individual conversations, it could keep up pretty well for a while at least until it was just so much noise that it couldn't segregate the, uh, the multiple conversations. So I don't know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Let's just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just assume it's a yes. Okay, um, so in general, the things we rely on computers to do are things that a human being could do, but they might be tedious, repetitive type tasks that a computer can do significantly quicker than we can without getting bored, without making little stupid hiccup mistakes, things like that, and leave the things that really only a human being, at least by today's standards, can do to, to the humans, right? You know, and what do we keep seeing each year? More and more jobs get replaced by robots and you know, eventually we'll just all be replaced by robots. Then we just go on vacation. Perfect. Okay, so we're all convinced that computers have a place and as computer programming ninjas, we'd like to force our computers to do something uh, so that we don't always have to do the work. Okay, so let's take a seven minute break. I'll get the first part of this video uploaded, then we'll um, talk about the topic for the semester when we come back. So back at 7.07. I didn't think you let us take breaks. Um, so, yeah, the people started complaining. So now I let you take oh. breaks, we just stay for six hours. <laughs> <laughs>